I'd really like this to be is a conversation among our distinguished presenters, but also <coughs> that's a uh, cutting edge technology from Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, we want to have a conversation with you as well on the things that you're interested in, so we'll make sure that we have plenty of time for that. I, uh, you've got the bios of our presenters in the materials today, but very Quickly to uh, my left, uh, Alice Albright from the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the CEO there, a distinguished and very experienced uh, person in government and in uh, the economic field within government, uh, running a, a remarkable initiative in our federal government created during the George W. Bush administration that's not well known but is generally in the United States at least, uh, and, and, but is very effective in our interests overseas. Uh, I do have to observe that uh, she has a very distinguished lineage. Uh, her, her mother uh, was a dynamic force of nature and was Secretary of State during my period of time as ambassador in Canada, so I had the great pleasure of working with her uh, and, and after she left as Secretary of State as well. Um, Peter Harrell, um, who I, I sort of look at this, as we're gonna ha have a, a little bit of a dichotomy here. Um, Alice is gonna be talk to you about what I'll call the uh, carrot in American outreach around the world, and Peter's gonna talk a little more about the stick <laughs> of American outreach in the world, and we can then take a poll after we discuss to see whether we think carrots or sticks are more effective in, in advancing the interests of not only American foreign policy, but of our values, our virtues, our beliefs, uh, because it's not all about the policy of one administration or another, but it's who we are as a society um, and, and how we try and export those values uh, around the world. So I will, uh, Peter has, uh, also extensive experience uh, in government in particular and, and um, I think most relevant to our discussion today is his time at the NSC, but uh, National Security Council in the White House and the, uh, I guess the NEC, National Economic mm -hmm. Council, sort of a joint appointment and, and also at the State Department. So we've got some extraordinarily thoughtful and experienced presenters and with that, I will ask Alice to make some introductory remarks, and then Peter, and then we can have a dialogue. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Giffen. My goodness, this is a bit loud. I wonder <laughs> if I should go like this and get a yeah. little bit further away from it. Okay. Uh, well, let me start by <clears throat> thanking everybody uh, so much for just a wonderful, warm welcome to your whole environment and community here. Uh, we've been here for a little over a day, and I've just met so many wonderful people. Uh, I have to say I didn't know a whole lot about Georgia Tech uh, before I came down, but meeting all of you, uh, I can tell it's a happen in place. Uh, Senator and Mrs. Nunn, it's just a delight to see you again. Um, we're old family friends. Uh, please give my best to Michelle, but it's just wonderful uh, to get to see you. It's been wonderful to see you. Uh, Ambassador Given, congratulations to all the new uh, diplomats and reticent residents. I feel like I want to apply to be a student uh, at the Sam Nunn School, um, but what a great place. Um, so I'm going to um, divide just a few introductory remarks into sort of two big buckets. Um, what, is, uh, what are some of the basics around MCC? And I'm gonna channel your who, what, why uh, sort of framework from earlier. And uh, there's a lot of information on the internet, so I won't go into uh, over too much detail on the who, what, why. Uh, but I will spend a bit of time briefly talking about the why does it matter and why does it matter now. Uh, in terms of the who, what, why, uh, we are an independent corporation within the U.S. government created in 2004, uh, specifically in the international development uh, slice of the U.S. government. Uh, we give big grants, which is the important word which I'll get to in a minute, 
uh, to countries to make transformational investments in the main areas of their economies and countries that are barriers to economic growth. Uh, so this is things like energy, agriculture, roads, education, uh, some health. Uh, it's the big things that aren't there. And uh, there is a chart, which we can get you a copy of, that really spells out exactly uh, what this is. Uh, we were created 20 years ago. Uh, since we've gotten started, we've done 74 of these grants. We've deployed just under $17 billion in about 45 countries. Um, and we estimate that we've made uh, the lives of about 320 million people better in uh, some way or another. So we've uh, gotten off to a strong start. Uh, we have a very uh, selective way of doing our work in terms of targeting our work. And um, our mission is reducing poverty through economic growth. Uh, there are two foundational aspects to how we do that. One is that we target our grant money, uh, which is very long-term money, to some of the key challenges that countries have. And we're very selective about picking countries with whom we think we can work well. So those are countries that are democracies or democratically governed, countries that are trying to fight corruption, countries that invest in their people, uh, and countries that are trying to run their economy well. And we have a whole process for uh, scoring countries on those different types of policy dimensions. And we just, in fact, released our latest scores. We do them every year uh, yesterday. So you can look on the internet and see what the scores of 80 countries are across all of those dimensions. Uh, so a country has to be has to be eligible. We're very selective about that, and they have to stay eligible. Um, another important part of how we work is uh, we're very clear about the benefits. So when we do a project, which is funded by U.S. taxpayer money, the benefits have to outweigh the costs, and we measure that. Uh, and we also design projects to make sure that the benefits outweigh the costs. So if we're laying uh, transmission lines, uh, and we see that there's a big population here who might be benefited from getting cheaper energy, and no population over there, we're going to go over here. Because we want to make sure that we are generating uh, positive benefits uh, for the people in the countries, but also with U.S. Uh, taxpayer money. Uh, we are very much of an on-time, on-budget place. Uh, once we start implementing, the work must be done in five years, period, the end. There are no exceptions. Well, there were four or five exceptions to that for one year during COVID, but we had to go to Congress to get approval for that. So it's basically five years. Uh, once we allocate an amount of money, we can't top it up and top it up and top it up. That's the amount of money. Um, and the money is given in grants. And if you are studying the uh, sort of landscape of international development, you'll see that a lot of other development agencies, other countries, uh, multilateral development banks are lending so the money has to be repaid. We are not lending, we are granting. Huge difference. Um, let me, and I've got a lot of examples uh, that I can share with you, but you know, we're building huge uh, transmission and distribution lines in Senegal. Uh, we're doing a similar project in Nepal. Uh, we're doing a big education program in the Kiribati. Um, on and on and on, we're doing a big battery storage project in Kosovo to help them uh, use their lignite coal uh, energy capability better. Did a lot of water work in Zambia. We're doing another big water project in Timor-Leste. Uh, so there's a long list of projects and examples where you can see what does it mean to make a transformational investment uh, in a country. Let me switch gears quickly and talk about why does this matter. And I'm going to divide it into five different areas, uh, some of which would be obvious and some may be less obvious. Poverty, risk, opportunity, building democratic partners through helping them uh, thrive, and resilience for the future. So poverty, the world is getting poorer and not richer. And uh, those of you who are studying the Sustainable Development Goals know that we're halfway through the SDGs, and there's a lot of work to be done. And the combination of COVID, of climate, of conflict all over the world is leaving many people in a worse off position than they were. Risks are multiplying. If you look at climate, instability, conflicts, uh, the risks of inequity, all of those types of things which are functions of poverty are creating instability in the world. So an agency that is trying to make a difference in remedying those uh, is ultimately reducing risk. Uh, there's also opportunity. Uh, many of you will know that uh, the growth markets in the world are in Africa and some in Asia. And we need to invest and make those countries investable 
in order to create follow-on investment opportunities for, uh, for American businesses. And so uh, there clearly are opportunities, but we have to work on some of the regulatory and environmental questions to make those opportunities investable. And I know there's a big uh, diaspora community here uh, in Atlanta who would be interested in that. We have to create democratic partners around the world for the U.S. to work with. And uh, one of the entry points of our work is working with democracies and helping them thrive. And in doing so, we are meeting a foreign policy objective that we have about helping to increase the number of countries that are democratically governed. And then finally, um, we, in our work, help countries be more resilient for the challenges of the future. And I'm thinking in particular about climate. Uh, right now, about 40% of our work in some way is related to helping countries contend with climate, and we've promised that that number is going to go up to 50% uh, over the coming years. So this is helping countries have better port infrastructure, better road infrastructure, switching to renewable energy, figuring out how to use their hydro uh, assets better, uh, and on and on and on. So um, that just gives you a bit of it, and happy to answer more questions uh, when we get to it. But thank you. On? Yeah, this is on. It's just not quite as loud as yours was, which is probably a good thing. Um, well, look, thanks for the uh, that got real loud. Um, thanks for the chance to be here, and thanks to the Nun School for uh, putting on the conference today. I had the chance to listen to the last panel as well, and just a really interesting discussion uh, all around. Um, you know, on that panel before lunch, we heard I think some important discussion about the ways in which the U.S. has historically used our diplomatic tools to advance U.S. economic goals, like opening markets abroad for U.S. products and opening uh, countries abroad as a place for American firms to invest. I'm going to use my opening remarks to talk about what in some ways I think is the conceptual flip side of that. Instead of talking about how we use diplomatic tools to advance our economic interests, I want to talk about how we use our economic tools to advance our diplomatic and geopolitical interests. And I think this often falls under the umbrella of a term, economic statecraft, which is a really old concept, but also one that has regained new relevance in recent years, as we seem to be using our economic tools more and more frequently for these diplomatic and geopolitical purposes. I divide economic statecraft into two big buckets, as I think the ambassador did in his opening remarks. There's a positive bucket, which is how we use economic inducements, like trade deals, like foreign assistance and development assistance, and investment to promote relationships with allies and partners, to build those relationships over time and to make the world a more secure place for the United States. And then there's a negative bucket, or a coercive bucket, and this is how we kind of weaponize the international economic order and global economic ties to use tools like sanctions and export controls to put pressures on our competitors, rogue regimes, and our adversaries. Now, as I said a moment ago, the idea of economic statecraft is not new. Uh, for example, the U.S. has long used trade agreements as a geopolitical tool. If I look at what happened at the end of the Second World War, when the U.S. and our allies promoted the general agreement on tariff and trade, the kind of predecessor to what's now called the World Trade Organization. The GATT was definitely, or the general agreement on tariff and trade, or GATT, the GATT was definitely intended to promote economic growth after the war, and in particular, there was an economic logic of trying to ensure that countries didn't return to the high tariff policies of the 1930s that a lot of economists in the 1940s and 50s thought contributed to the Great Depression. But there was also very much a geopolitical and strategic logic to the GATT of building a kind of Western economic alliance and knitting together the economies of the West to uh, strengthen ourselves and our position in the early days of the Cold War. And I think you've seen a similar pattern if you look at U.S. trade deals in recent decades, of really using our trade deals to deepen our economic uh, uh, decade, uh, our economic relationships. Just to throw out an example, modern economic trade deals, the kind of things you might have heard of as an FTA or free trade agreement, actually only date to the 1980s. Does anyone want to guess what the first U.S. trade deal in the modern era was? Yeah, here. Was it the peace deal with Canada? No, it was not. Uh, Israel, 1985. Um, 
the first sort of comprehensive, which I would, I would, I would just say, like Israel at the time was obviously not a huge export market for American goods, right? It was a small, uh, small market, um, but a very important geopolitical ally in a very complicated uh, region. And I think you saw that same kind of dynamic play out at other times uh, in our history more recently. So, for example, after uh, the 9/11 terrorist attacks, uh, President. Uh, then President George W. Bush, in addition to founding the MCC and doing uh, other kinds of things like that, negotiating, negotiated trade deals with Morocco, with Oman, and with Jordan. Again, not countries that were really going to be huge markets, all things considered, for American goods, maybe important markets, but not the biggest markets out there, but that were very much geopolitically important countries as we look to stabilize the Middle East. And I think today you see a similar kind of dynamic with the Biden administration's so-called Indo-Pacific economic framework, which is not really a trade deal, but is very much intended to knit together the uh, economies of the United States and a number of potentially allied economic countries in Asia in order to position ourselves better for this era of geopolitical competition uh, with, uh, with China that we seem to be in. And I think the, the overall strategic theory is that greater trade can deepen alliances and geopolitical uh, rela relationships. So for example, the US has an interest in making sure that countries like Indonesia, which is an important source of minerals for electric ba vehicle batteries, have a good relationship with the US so that we can secure the minerals and so that we can secure our strategic position in the, uh, in the region. Um, now, as I said, there's also a coercive side to economic statecraft. And as anyone who's been following international news over the past few years probably has seen, the US has become a very active user of economic tools like sanctions and export controls uh, to put pressure on our adversaries. For example, just last year, in the first part of last year, sanctions and export controls were a big part of the US response and the Western allied G7 response to Russia's attack on Ukraine. Now, uh, as I think it was uh, either Larry or uh, uh, Bill on the last panel mentioned, sanctions and export controls in a certain way go back uh, a very long time. Uh, actually, if you go back to ancient Greece, the first uh, documented use of these kind of tools was occurred in 432 BC when Athens imposed an economic embargo on Megara, a city that was then aligned with Sparta including things like banning Megarian merchant ships from coming into the port of Athens and other Athenian ports. And I just point that out, so in, in some sense last year, in April of last year, when President Biden banned Russian ships from coming to American parts, he was just continuing in 2,500 years of human, uh, of human history. <laughs> but I think that one of the things that's made sanctions and export control so frequent over the last couple of decades is the way that the global economy developed between the 1980s to the 2010s. And this kind of era of economic globalization created new opportunities to weaponize economic interdependence. During the Cold War, for example, the US just didn't have a lot to trade with the Soviet Union. We did weaponize what we had. For example, if you wanted to export many kinds of even kind of medium tech products, to Russia, you, you actually couldn't do that without a State Department license. And after Russia invaded Afghanistan in 1979, then President Carter cut off American grain exports to Russia. But overall, there just wasn't a lot of economic ties to be, to be weaponized. But during that period of globalization between kind of the early 80s and maybe the late 2010s, global trade and financial ties spread and supply chains moved globally creating a bunch of new kind of choke points, if you think about it, or economic levers that the US and our allies could weaponize to promote our diplomatic and geopolitical interests. So for today, for example, after Russia invaded Ukraine, we're able to cut off things like semiconductors going to Russia that Russia needs to build trucks and other kinds of uh, material for its war effort in Ukraine. And obviously, over the last year, there's been a lot of focus on sanctions and export controls in Russia. But we also have them still on Iran, obviously long-standing sanctions on places like Cuba, and a range of other uh, targets. And I think there's a very active debate right now in Washington about how to potentially use some of these tools against China. 
And already for the last year, not nearly to the extent we have on Russia, but we've begun to restrict China's access to certain kinds of higher end semiconductors. I do think there are a bunch of important questions about how well all of this works. And indeed, if we are going to be in kind of a deglobalizing era, will that ultimately undermine the efficacy and power of some of these coercive uh, measures? Uh, and I look forward to talking about these kinds of issues in the Q&A discussion. Well, two very provocative and uh, uh, thought-inspiring presentations. Um, I, I, I have to, when you're talking about sanctions, and you mentioned Cuba, when I was in Canada, then Prime Minister Chrétien used to, we, we used to have this, one of the things Canadians criticized the United States about was our embargo of Cuba. We said, you know, how's that working? Is it, you know, is, is Castro still there? And <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of the Cuban embargo, but it was U.S. policy, so in public I obviously had to be supportive of it. And the only thing I could think of to say was, well, how's your open policy working? Is Castro still there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and so you couldn't figure out at that point by looking at our two policies whether the carrot or the stick w was, was effective because at, at that point nothing was working. Um, although Mr. Kretchen would also with a smile look at me and say, well, when you finally figure out your policy's wrong, you'll arrive in Havana and all the hotels will be owned by Canadians. <laughs> so, which was his view of economic development. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I have a lot of Canadian stories. Uh, the, the, um, w one of the things I wanted to ask you, Alice, is, and I probably should know the answer to this, but to what degree are the standards and goals that you implement at the MCC, statutory, and to what degree are they discretionary and in, in, in how you or whoever the leadership of the enterprise uh, might see advancing the mission of, of the MCC. And I, I ask that partially because um, to the degree ad administrations change perspectives on what we should be doing in, in terms of, I'll say, soft power will change, but to the extent that the goals and standards are statutory, it's harder to change them. So I'm, I'm just interested. Well, it's a great question. Um, we are and have been for 20 years lucky to have bipartisan support, uh, and it's very deep and strong bipartisan support. And uh, so our statutes do say certain things, but they also set up expectations. And you know, if there's one expectation that we have a very selective process for choosing countries, uh, and that's really sort of at our core. Um, there are no stated expectations about what sector we work in, with the exception of military, uh, things that are uh, military. Um, there is an expectation that we measure uh, what we call the economic rate of return, which is the, the benefits versus the costs. So there are uh, expectations, and it's grown up also uh, through all of our uh, work with Congress, that there's certain expectations about how we operate that will not change. Uh, but there are not earmarks about certain sectors that we have to work in. There are not earmarks about uh, you cannot ever work. I mean, we have our, our selection criteria that determine who we work with. Um, but it stays. One thing that's sort of the beauty of it is it stays pretty constant administration to administration. So I, I, I'm intrigued by uh, the uh, thought that if we didn't have an initiative like this, that there would be a void that some of our either commercial or for that matter geopolitical adversaries would fill. So. Uh, Presumably, if you weren't in the market, mm. that well-defined market, the Chinese would be there. Yes, and we, we are seeing that. Uh, that's one of the big things that's changed um, in the context uh, over the 20 years since the agency was created. Uh, when we were created, the, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative was, you know, it may have been uh, in formation, but it was by no means as prevalent in evidence sort of day by day uh, as it is now. Um, 
The main comparison point between ourselves and what China is doing with the Belt and Roads initiatives is the availability of grant funding. So we are unique in the amount of grant funding that we can provide to countries and in the sizes of it. So the, you know, the average size of one of our big programs is $350 million over time, but the, the more recent ones are four and $500 million. Uh, the average size of a Chinese grant, which is a small part of their overall development assistance, which is most of all loans, is about $100 million. Uh, so we clearly occupy a space when it comes to infrastructure finance um, that is uh, clearly a counterpoint to China. Now, we don't operate everywhere that China does because we are so selective about working with democracies. Um, but where we are working with countries, we are clearly uh, a counterpoint to China. So, um, um, U.S. Senator from Georgia from several decades ago <laughs> used to make an annual speech on the floor of the Senate where he included as part of his speech, and it wasn't Sam Nunn, it was, it was Harmon Talmadge Sr. to Sam Nunn at the time, where he would say, we need an American desk at the State Department. And his theme was that the State Department <laughs> in some people's minds, uh, particularly enterprises at that time, say USAID, were uh, doing things that were in the interest perhaps of the people they were helping, but not necessarily in the interest uh, of the United States. And it was a flippant way mm -hmm. to say we need an American desk at the State Department. So actually I still hear some people criticize USAID, but I never hear anyone criticizing MCC, so do you have any thoughts about, are we advancing U.S. interests overseas um, in a broad way, I don't mean narrow interests, uh, and um, is that well recognized? Well, I think our work can be, uh, I always say it's under, under known, under understood, so we could do a better job as sort of publicizing ourselves, and that's why a lot of my teammates are back there and they do a great job but there's a presumption underlying our work, which is that the more countries that are uh, democratically governed, uh, where they have transparent processes, where procurement is undertaken well, where governments are following uh, environmental and social standards properly, where people are educated, where there are, where there's uh, some expectation of good health care. Uh, if, if countries that have those characteristics in place are helpful as U.S. friends and allies, then we are clearly advancing U.S. interests. Uh, but in particular, it's around democracy. And we have a very, with the countries that we are working with, we are, uh, we have a very strong position of leverage in encouraging them to remain democracies. So uh, just in the, uh, the short time that I've been at the agency, we've had two interesting circumstances about countries that all of a sudden did not become democracies. Now, what do we do about it? One was Burkina Faso when there was a coup uh, that happened just a, two weeks before I got to the agency, and then just recently in Niger. So in both cases, uh, those governments were subject to coups. We had had huge amounts of grant money uh, on the way. In the case of Burkina Faso, we had a billion dollars uh, on the line in two different projects. In Niger, had there not been a coup, we would have deployed $772 million. So we stepped away from Burkina Faso of a billion dollars, two different projects. We first suspended them, and then we terminated them. Uh, we did it in two steps because we wanted to give them a chance to reconsider. Uh, and then with Niger, in response to the coup just now, we have suspended. And we are hoping uh, that they decide to have elections and that they uh, get back on a democratic pathway. So we have significant leverage to encourage countries to stay de being democracies. And we're very, we don't, we don't walk on eggshells around it. So, and, and Peter, I'm, I'm gonna get to you, but this provokes one question I don't, to, in my mind, and I don't mean to be flippant by asking this question. To what degree do you, does your agency, do we as a country now confront, in light of recent events, in our country, uh, confront others asking, well, um, where do you get off talking about um, 
how efficient democracy should be. Do we have a little problem with uh, having a look in the mirror? Well, there's a whole discussion there, but um, <laughs> uh, well, we we know we know that now we have a slightly different history on this that we have to take into consideration in our our interaction with other governments, uh, where we say. And we don't, haven't changed our standards, but what we say is, you know, we are also have our own journey here, and we become a bit more humble about it. Um, but we don't change our standards. We still want to work with countries that are democracies, which you raise an interesting topic. Yes. <laughs> well, and at least in my experience, our, our foreign policy hasn't typically, over the years, included the concept of humble, but... Uh, we, well, we, we, try, we, we try to be a little we bit. Can, <laughs> we, can, we can work on that. Uh, Peter, I, I, uh, w one thing occurred to me when, when the, the prior panel was, was uh, when Bill was talking, he referred sort of in passing to the TPP. And I think of trade agreements in two, um, at least in two different silos. One is the economics of the trade agreement. Is it, are we opening markets for Americans? And, or are we advancing our economic interests and principles? But the other is trade agreements are a little bit of a political club. I don't mean a belligerent club, but an association. And the U.S. for in the initial stages of the TPP was a motivating factor. And it was in a region of the world that is quite important and getting more important. Uh, but yet, all of a sudden, we have a change of administrations and we withdraw from the TPP. Uh, on, on the second set of standards, not the economic analysis, but withdrawing from the TPP, was that a geopolitical mistake? Oh, that's a great... Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Yeah. No, it's a TPP it was a, a trade, is a trade deal. It, it exists. We're just not a piece of it. They rebranded it the CPTPP. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, the XUS <laughs> TPP. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it exists. It was uh, an agreement that um, President Obama, then President Obama, uh, was quite instrumental in uh, helping to negotiate. And then, as Ambassador says, when Trump came in, he withdrew. Uh, and Biden. President Biden has made pretty clear that we are not um, going back into it. Um, I think actually what you say, what you put on the table illustrates one of the tensions we have on trade policy right now. Because I actually think from a strategic perspective, if I'm just thinking, you know, geopolitics from a strategic perspective, yeah, it was a mistake uh, to withdraw. Because I think at the end of the day, we are in an era of geopolitical competition with China. We want to have good relationships with a bunch of allies and partners uh, in, uh, in Asia. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, not, not only not being there, but particularly sort of being there and then stepping back, you know, carries real geopolitical costs. But trade deals, you know, I talked in my opening remarks about the geopolitical logic, but for a trade deal to work for the U.S., there has to be both a geopolitical logic and there has to be an economic logic. And of course, there also has to be a political logic to get it through our Congress. And I do think that the economic side of the TPP probably, by the kind of policies, economic policies, not just, that are sort of now have bipartisan support in Washington, probably doesn't measure up. And so I think this is kind of an example of a challenge we're going to face until we kind of get through this domestic rethink we're kind of in the middle of on the economic front. Because it's hard for us to go out and negotiate deals internationally when we haven't really figured out, for example, are we for industrial policy in this country or are we not for industrial policy? Because typically in a trade deal, we were against industrial policy and we tried to go out and negotiate rules, uh, barring other countries from doing industrial policy. But if we're now maybe for industrial policy, what do those rules look like? I don't know, right? And so I think we do have to get through that kind of domestic economic debate um, uh, before we can do trade deals. Catherine Tai, the current U.S. Trade Representative, made this point 
uh, two weeks ago, the U.S. for many years, 10 years or more, had been pushing uh, for a, a global kind of uh, digital standard agreement, actually as part of the WTO, and she just withdrew U.S. support after 10 years for that provision. And her point, you can agree or disagree, her point is, well, for 10 years we've been out fighting for things like you can't localize data in your country. Uh, you have to let it flow across borders. You can't regulate big tech companies and things like that. And she says, you know, now here at home, like all my regulatory comments are trying to regulate the big tech companies. And they're actually trying to force some of the data to be localized here. So what's the rule I'm supposed to go out and negotiate? And, and I just think this is going to be a reality for us until we get to a little bit more consensus on some of these domestic economic issues. Yeah, it, 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 it's probably, uh, what you just described, I think, may be symptomatic of our system for, for better or, or worse, meaning the, those of us who have been engaged in representing the United States with foreign governments and in other settings internationally, we do regularly get questions about, well, how do we rely on the continuity of the United States leadership and or views on, on a given subject? Um, and, and I guess some of that, the answer is it's systemic. You can't necessarily, I mean, there should be some irrevocable sort of base level standards that we have as a society, as a country which may not apply to economics, but, and, and you know, when the, there's some concerns as far as that's concerned, but we do run into more and more now the, uh, how do we know wh who the U.S. is gonna be next year? Uh, and maybe that's just systemic, but do you have any views as to how we address the continuity problem? I mean, I'm an international <laughs> policymaker, not a domestic one. I, but I, I, I agree. I hear the same thing. I mean, I was just in Singapore uh, last couple of days. I uh, got back late last, uh, actually technically early this morning. Um, and I heard this all the time. I mean, it just kind of, um, I was at a, a, couple, a conference and, you know, a bunch of folks from uh, the Asia region were there, you know, people from Indonesia and Korea and India. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like, how can we, uh, again, a lot like, Biden administration has this initiative called IPATH, you know, which is not a trade deal, but they're trying to do in lieu of a trade deal. But I just get all these questions. Kind of, well, Trump comes back in, he's certainly going to rip that up. So why would we make any, you know, reliances on this existing? And I, I did not have a good answer for that, to be honest. <laughs> 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 Started to mumble. <laughs> so, so, well, that was more of a philosophical question. L let me ask you about uh, a particular uh, example of U.S. sanctions. We've had U.S. sanctions uh, imposed on Venezuela for, I don't know, a long time mm. because we are, among other things, trying to advance democratic ideals <coughs> and market economy and all those mm. good things. Uh, all of a sudden now we're relaxing our sanctions on Venezuela. Has Maduro all of a sudden become a Democrat, small d, uh, or is the potential disruption in the global oil market causing us to um, reevaluate our uh, principled view of how Venezuela should be advancing? I actually think it's a question of what works and doesn't work, and uh, you know, you you. Um, you brought up the Canadians uh, talking about how sanctions on Cuba were working. And I, I was re remembering when you said that back in the 1990s, uh, it's a political cartoon I remember uh, seeing. Uh, and it had a little you know, sketch of President Kennedy and LBJ and Nixon and Ford and Carter and Reagan and Bush and Clinton. And they were all saying one word, right? Each president has said one word in the cartoon. And they all spelled out, it all read together, it was, don't worry, Castro will fall any day now. And of course, we've had, what, three more presidents since then. And Castro has died, but the regime is still, you know, is still in place. And I think that does uh, kind of bring home uh, a really profound question about when sanctions work and when they don't work. And I think we have seen cases of them working, like South Africa in the 1980s. I think the sanctions on South Africa were really influential in bringing to an end the apartheid 
uh, the apartheid uh, regime. I think we've seen sanctions play an important role back under the Obama administration getting Iran to negotiate a nuclear deal where they, they actually put limits. You could, Iran was not becoming Switzerland, it was not a nice country, but they were putting limits on their nuclear program, which are not in place today because we walked away to the point you made, uh, to the point you made, uh, you made earlier. So I, I think we've seen instances of sanctions working. But I think we've also seen a lot of instances where a sanctioned country just has a really entrenched leader and you're not really getting anything or any forward momentum on that. And I think that was in some sense the direction we were going with Venezuela where there were a bunch of sanctions filed on Venezuela. Uh, Maduro's a admittedly quite odious dictator uh, of uh, Venezuela was, was actually getting more and more entrenched. There was a moment actually early in the Trump administration he was under a lot of pressure and might have had to go, but then the Chinese and the Russians kind of bailed him out. And over the last four or five years, he'd just gotten more and more entrenched. And I think the White House's judgment here was kind of, we, we, you know, our policy here, we've, we've gone in a box canyon. And like pushing more on this is not actually going to get us any results. And it's not just that Maduro's not going, it's that Venezuela is actually now the largest source of migrants to the United States over the last couple of months because of the economic crisis down there. Um, it's become one of the biggest sources of narco-trafficking uh, for drugs coming into the U.S. across the Caribbean. So you have all these like bad externalities and he's not going anywhere. And I don't think he's going to become a Democrat, a uh, small d Democrat, but I do think what the administration is trying to do is kind of move this policy that was just stuck and not getting us much on really a couple of issues that we care about and move it towards with a healthy dose of skepticism, but maybe we can at least make some incremental progress on a couple of issues. Yeah, it sounds more like faith than, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know, I may have missed it, but, but you may have inadvertently in your litany of presidents omitted President Carter. Uh, no, I, I thought and, I did have it. He was there on my list, so and, I don't read but, it. <laughs> but the, uh, I, again, those of you who know me, I can always find a story about Canada that relates to a subject, but President Carter came to the funeral of Pierre Elliott Trudeau in Canada while I was there. And I had, President Clinton was busy at Camp David in the last days of his administration, and, and he couldn't come, so he just said, you know, who else would be a good idea? I said President Carter, because he worked with Trudeau. President Clinton signed off on it. The State Department was very nervous about it because the other, another world dignitary that was coming was Castro because mm -hmm. Canada under Trudeau had had quite strong relationships with Castro. So the State Department, not, not your mother, called <laughs> me up and said, this is a big mistake. We don't want Carter talking to Castro. He'll end up you know, promising to open a dialogue and we don't want a dialogue. <laughs> And, and, and uh, being the honest and forthright person that I am, I, my response was, well, I just won't get a translator. We won't have a <laughs> Spanish translator. Of course, I knew that President Carter's functional in Spanish. He's not fluent, <laughs> but he's functional. President Carter ended up spending an hour and a half in a green room with Fidel Castro with no one else in the room. And I'm terrified of what he's going to tell me when he, when, he, when he comes out. And he had negotiated a deal with Castro where he three months later went to Cuba and was permitted to make a speech at Havana University that was televised in which he was quite critical of some of the human rights policies and attitudes of Castro, which you know almost got me fired uh, as ambassador. But in any event, Carter was quite engaged with, with Cuba and was trying a little bit different than the conventional U.S. policy. Um, so, Alice, one of the questions, we, 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 we touched on this when we were sitting having something to eat, but it really intrigues me that, that we, we clearly have a crisis of immigration and migration in this country. And if you look at the work of the MCC, it's largely... Um, not in the Western Hemisphere, if not entirely not in the Western Hemisphere. And at least 
a theory would be that if the living conditions in certain countries to our south were better, if the economies were better, if the infrastructure was better, these people don't really want to leave their country. They're leaving because, in effect, they're being repelled by adverse conditions for them and their families. So I guess my question is, to what degree is there thought being given to how consistent with the statutory and, and other standards that apply to doing work in our hemisphere, one, because there are disadvantaged countries, obviously, developing countries, but secondly, because it would have the collateral benefit of another policy goal of our country and, and might save us money on walls. Uh, well, great question. Um, so uh, I'm glad I have my history chart in front of me here. Um, way back when, when the agency was started, we did a bit of work in Latin, America, in Latin and Central America. And uh, because at the time, um, a couple of the countries in the region basically passed our two big eligibility requirements. One is that they were poor enough, and two is that they were uh, on a path of being democratically governed. So since that time, those earlier years of MCC, those two circumstances have changed. One is a good news thing and one is a bad news thing. So a number of countries in the region have gotten richer and so they do not qualify as being low income or lower middle income, but their politics and their adherence to sort of wanting to be democracies and fighting corruption have gone way downhill. So at the moment, they're not eligible for various reasons. Now, what are we doing about it? Um, we are trying to get a piece of legislation uh, passed. We're making good progress, but we're not there yet. Uh, that would essentially take the number of countries that we could work in and increase it from about 80 up to about 112, 115. And some of the countries in the region could then become eligible for consideration. We'd still have to look at them about whether or not they're trying to be democracies and fight corruption. Uh, but they at least be up for consideration. And we're very well aware that uh, of all the major regions of the world, except for a country that we're working with right now, which is Belize, we're not working with enough countries in the region. But we're getting to the place of possible consideration by looking at our overall eligibility standards around levels of poverty um, and increasing it a bit, rather than giving sort of a separate kind of policy in to a particular region which we would be reluctant to do. And, and uh, I'll ask one more question and then see if there's any questions in the audience. Um, to what degree, if at all, do you um, uh, communicate with, collaborate with uh, agencies in, in other governments who may be like-minded and have similar goals and purposes in order to, you know, in effect, leverage up other assets to try and address the goals that we right. might have in common? Well, you, you, you of course know that the sort of main flagship um, aid agency is USAID. So they're the ones who really are in charge of being kind of the country to country inter, you know, interlocutor with other aid agencies, G20, G7, et cetera. Um, that said, uh, there are parts of the world where we would uh, really benefit from joining up with people. And the example that comes to mind is the Pacific. Um, so we uh, already have started working with Kiribati and the Solomon Islands. We did do a program with Vanuatu. Uh, they are far away places that need a lot of money. And so we've started talking to uh, the Australians, for example, to partner up with us. So we do do it on occasion. Uh, we spend a lot of time. I was just in uh, the Gambia where uh, we're looking at um, it's early stage, but it's either, we're either going to be working on something to do with their port, something to do with um, upgrading their whole sort of river transportation uh, capability or education. And uh, we're already talking to the EU and others about uh, possibly joining forces with us. So it happens episodically. It doesn't happen routinely. Thank you. I, I, don't, I don't know about y'all, but I could talk about this for another couple of hours, but can't. So do, uh, do we have any questions? Um, Larry, 
effective sanction, U.S. sanctions are. Is it uh, kind of an indirect benefit of sanctions that we do change some countries' behavior, not, but not necessarily the country that's sanctioned? To give you an example, in 2014, Russia invades Crimea. Europe says, you know, we should have learned a lesson a long time ago, but we're really going to wean ourselves off of Russian gas and oil now because of Crimea, 2014. Fast forward, they didn't do much of anything to wean themselves off. But this time, it's been different. I don't know how long it will last. But do you think that's been a benefit of sanctions is for some of these countries to look at some of their relationships and say, this is too risky, it's too vulnerable, o over time we need to diversify you know, and not get dependent on any one particular country, obviously including, I mean, especially one ruled by Vladimir Putin. So I think it's a great question. There's been uh, quite a bit of academic literature, particularly over the last maybe 10 years, uh, looking at, at sort of this question of when and how are sanctions effective. And I think you, Larry, raise a really important point, which is if you're thinking about efficacy, like you gotta think about what exactly your, your goal might be. And you say, okay, our sanction on whatever, you know, Iran or, 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 or Venezuela may be, be regime change. But with a lot of sanctions, there are also other kinds of goals. Like I think the sanctions on Russia right now, no one really, at least in the Biden administration, thinks the sanctions on Russia are what's gonna get Russia to um, stop its war on Ukraine. But there is some evidence they're making it harder for Russia to get the material and kind of money and things. Now, it's still prosecuting its war, but just sort of, sort of just as you're arming the Ukrainians, if you can degrade Russia's uh, you know, military base, like that's probably a good outcome. So you got those kind of, and then you have um, third country signaling uh, benefits uh, of sanctions. Like I do think the Chinese look at what is happening with Russia's war on Ukraine and they kind of look at that and think, well, okay, there would be real costs if we invaded Taiwan. I think there are a lot of factors that go into their calculus, but I think there's an important third country signaling, like you can't do that for free. Uh, and I think that has value. And then I, I think you actually raise um, uh, another point which I, I actually think that, that policymakers don't think about enough in the sanctions context, which is that sanctions can be used as kind of moments of opportunity to, to get a country to de-risk, you know, de-risk a relationship, right? And there's actually a certain history of that. I mean, Reagan uh, back in 82, after the crackdown in Poland, late 81, early 82, after the Soviet Union crackdown in Poland, at a, uh, there was a not quite popular uprising, more protests, and the Soviet Union really cracked down, and Reagan tried to use sanctions to stop what was then under construction of one of the first Russia to European pipelines. And it was sort of both about putting pressure on the Russians, but also very early endeavor, like we don't want Europe to be dependent on Russian gas here. The Europeans squawked, he kind of abandoned that effort. There's a lot of history that the Europeans got very dependent on Russian gas. So I, I very much take your point. I think we don't think enough about that. There's like a reducing dependency element that we should think about more directly. Cameron Lewis, I guess I'm a Sam Nunn alumni, but this is another question for Peter as well. Forgive me, I'm, I like to think of myself as a historian, and be it by coincidence or fate, I've recently been reading up on the Medici family, and I'm not sure if they were familiar about the economic tools they've been using to advance their name back in those days, but to not bore you with the historical facts and whatnot, my question would be along the lines of how the Medici family were kind of using their name and their banking slash diplomacy to push their foreign policy objectives. In what way do the, does the US kind of avoid getting overthrown like the Medici's were? <laughs> sort of like with like, to kind of go down the routes of like various trade packages we've seen, not just from us, but from like China, which is their Belt and Road Initiative. We're starting to see the cracks on that. Countries are starting to be aware of how these deals aren't exactly in our best interest, how is it, where where exactly does the U.S. step in, or if it should step in, to kind of say, bettering relations to get them to come on our side, essentially? 
great question, and I very much like the history. I mean, I, you know, I've cited a number of historical anecdotes. No, no, I, I think it is really important to be grounded in making policy today by a sense of history and what worked and what didn't work uh, previously. Um, but but I, I actually think Alice should opine on this too as somebody's running one of the tools that can help build these relationships. Although I think one big difference between what we do and what I think the Chinese do is we, we do, well, we use these tools for geopolitical relationships. We definitely do trade, development assistance, US aid, I think is much more explicitly political than the MCC, for example. Well, we do use them for kind of overtly uh, political uh, objectives. Today, really, particularly since the end of the Cold War, my sense at least is that we, we also tend to have, try to have a, a kind of a standards-based approach and blending a kind of political objective, but also we're not, we're not literally just gonna be kind of giving bags of cash. I and mean, that definitely happened back in the Cold War, right, with other agencies doing that, but we, we tend not to do so much of that today. It really is about take a standards-based approach that actually has some real material benefit to these countries we're working with. Because at the end of the day, that's gonna build a longer term relationship. If you know they can see power infrastructure, if they can see um, uh, you know, road uh, uh, that, that they don't owe the Chinese a billion dollars for, but they actually own, like that's gonna build a much longer term relationship than you know, sort of shorter term just payoffs. Yeah, I, I would very much agree with that. Uh, I mean, in addition to, if you think about what does MCC give a country, certainly money. Uh, to go do something uh, productive with it. Um, but there's so much more to that. It's know-how, it's having undertaken a project according to a set of international standards, it's transparency around procurement, it's a lot of uh, training uh, in various uh, areas for their people. Um, so when all is said and done, the countries are left with, and we also work on, on a lot of regulatory reform. Uh, so we'll help an energy sector figure out how do you separate the transmission company from the distribution company and run them pro properly. Uh, and so they're left with a lot of what I would call soft aspects and a lot of hard aspects. And in doing so, we've made, um, you know, we've really strengthened the relationship between the U.S. and the country without any interest to pay at the end of it. Or debt, to pay, or principal, interest or principal. So regrettably, because of the fact that Colleen? Yes. And then I'm going to ask Alistair to come up and close us out. I have to catch up. Alice, as CEO of MCC, uh, one of your uh, five main missions is the promoting of democracy. And I find it so wonderful that your mother, as Secretary of State, and later afterwards, was so involved in advocacy for democracies and also for human rights. And it's just does my heart good to yeah. see that you're following in her footsteps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, th those of you who are students or prospective students, if you, if you want more of this kind of dialogue, sign up for the courses that are being taught by our diplomats and residents, the new and dynamic uh, curriculum available at the Sam Nunn School. <laughs> I, feel like I, I, want to I would sign like to ask you to join me in thanking all of the speakers for giving their time and sharing their insights with us. And I want to reiterate our gratitude to our funders, the Arthur Blank Family Foundation and Bank of America, and to our co sponsors, GT Cyber. I'd also like to thank uh, Mary Lou Suarez, who made everything run. Where's Mary Lou? She's making things run. Um, and to um, the students' assistants who helped out, especially Sung Hyun Han, who's around the corner, and Aubrey Ward. Um, and this is just the start. So we're going to be having more programming going forward. So keep your eyes out for that. And I hope to see you at events in the future. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.